from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. I'm Tyne Morgan, and here's what we're working on for you over the next 60 minutes. A surprising boost in soybean crop condition ratings this week and prices plummet. Dow Jones Industrial wiping out the 22,000 ceiling, but does the stock market have more legs to run higher? As the dust settles from the dairy trade fallout with Canada, one family farm doesn't look the same. I see a milk truck I, and the dairy magazines come, it's like, It's a sad ending with Grassland Dairy. That's our Farm Journal report. It's a bird, it's a plane. Nope, it's a ski jumper. Why do you like flying? Because I really like birds. That's American countryside. And in John's world? Drones versus tractors. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Chevy Silverado. High strength steel for high strength dependability. Now for the market-related news, USDA shocking the market by raising crop conditions this week. The soybean market didn't like the news, plummeting more than 30 cents on Tuesday. USDA says soybean ratings improved two points in a week, now 59 percent good to excellent. Most of that can be attributed to better conditions in the east. USDA bumped Illinois ratings up seven points this week, and Indiana jumped four points. And for corn, USDA shaving a point off of corn conditions, now 61 percent is rated good to excellent now. Nationally, Iowa saw conditions decline three points. Indiana dropped two points. Condition ratings moving the markets in Chicago this week, especially in soybeans. Here's Joe Baklovic of Standard Grain. You know, usually we see corn and soybean ratings deteriorate as we move closer to harvest, and we uh, saw the opposite of that this week in the bean market. So that kind of helped to spur some of the selling pressure, I believe. Meanwhile, the Dow Jones Industrial reaching a new milestone, closing above 22,000 for the first time ever. The Dow on an impressive run this year with 32 record closes already. The Dow hit 21,000 on March 1st. The momentum from the Trump administration's policies viewed as pro-growth. All right, those are the headlines. Meteorologist Cindy Claussen is in for Mike Hoffman this week. Cindy, we see drought expanding a bit in Iowa. Yeah, time. We really are watching areas in the upper Midwest and into much of the northern Plains states because we've seen that drought intensifying, especially in the Dakotas and into Montana. Check out how it's been over the past month or so. We've really seen that intensification that spread to the east and even into the south as we've been over the past four weeks or so. And we've even seen some of that stretching a little bit further into the Corn Belt. We still have a little bit of the southern Plains as well, but this is the area we're going to continue to watch over the next several months. Months. All right, what do we have to look forward to this week? Well, we are looking at some wet weather in the eastern part of the country as a uh, storm system moves across the eastern part there. Some sunshine at least to start your week in parts of the upper Midwest and into the Plains states. Now, as we head into Wednesday, what we expect to see is shower and thunderstorm activity across the southeastern quarter of the country and yet another front will start to move in to the North Central United States that'll bring showers and thunderstorms from the Western Great Lakes all the way into the Pacific Northwest as we see that stationary front trailing back there. Pretty hot though. That's going to continue in the Southwest and even a uh, pretty warm weather in much of the uh, West Coast as well when they don't have any rain there. High pressure influencing much of the Northeast on Wednesday, but then by Friday we're going to see those fronts continuing to move. Maybe a secondary front affecting the Great Lakes, but then we'll keep an eye on a low pressure system that will bring some showers and thunderstorms into the Central Central and Southern Plains on Friday. We'll have more weather coming up in the next half hour time. All right, thanks, Cindy. Well, our roundtables are on the road this week from Union City, Tennessee, from crop conditions to the surging stock market. We'll cover it all after the break. U.S. Farm Report on the Road is brought to you by DeKalb Asgro Delta Pine. Visit DeKalb.com to see the difference proven performance and leading innovation can make on your farm. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. Well, our marketing roundtables this week were on the road. This week they allowed us to come down to Union City, Tennessee. We're at the Asgro DeKalb Grower Showcase. A great day. I mean, I was expecting 100 degree temperatures. Uh, definitely not cool today, but not that warm as well. So uh, we appreciate the, the nice weather as we made our trip down. Brian, speaking of weather, uh, this week we saw favorable weather forecasts. We saw USDA actually boost soybean condition ratings. 
That did not create a good recipe for soybean prices. We saw soybean prices plummet 30 cents on Tuesday. Is it just because of, of weather and crop conditions? It is. Uh, we're at that time of the year where uh, weather is everything for bean production. When you uh, went into the end of last week, you had a drier forecast, six to 10 day forecast, then came out on Friday and Saturday, started to change that, uh, pushing rain into the entire Midwest with the exception of the Northwest. And consequently, at this time of year, rain trumps ratings by far. Uh, you talk to a producer who's been struggling with heat, he can have 20, 30 days of heat or dry weather. One good rain evaporates that concern in a hurry. So that's what the market traded was a better weather forecast. Ratings ticked up a little bit because of the rain the previous week, in particular Iowa, Illinois, where uh, where you saw much needed moisture in parts of Minnesota, Nebraska. So, um, so improving conditions or better yield potential, as, as I'd like to call it. Yeah. yeah, it'll be interesting to see what USDA does on Monday. But what scares me is we keep talking about with soybeans at least, weather, we know, you know the weather in August is what makes or breaks soybeans. We saw a favorable weather forecast this past week. If we see a favorable weather forecast this next week, how low could we see these soybean prices yeah. go? You know, we start out every year trying to, trying to you know, go with a wide range, and then we narrow that in as the season wears on with a lot of flexibility as summer pushes because that'll determine the real direction. Either we move up or we move down. Right now, that pendulum is beginning to swing down. There's a gap on charts that was left uh, on June 30th at 9.58 November beans. It's likely that'll get filled. If we have another week of good weather, it's possible we could eventually work our way down to $9 on November. That's just what happens when you use $10 as a pivot point. You're always a dollar away from beans moving up or down. The vote is for down now because of the rain. Real quick, what about corn? We saw USDA shave a point off of the national corn condition ratings. Um, really, you know, we look at this weather, but is, is, is soybeans dragging corn prices down as well? Or at this point, are we not seeing that correlation happen? It, it's both. Uh, when, when corn is rated as poorly as it has been in areas, that corn's not going to all of a sudden get a lot better. Beans have a tendency to hang on during drier weather, and if they can get timely rains, maybe produce better than, than you might think when you're going through those dry stretches. So with corn, the ratings have gone down. You look at the private estimates, there's a lot of yield estimates between, let's say, 162 and 168. We're right around that 165 to 167. I always fudge up a couple for technology and just better yeah. farming and yeah. genetics and tillage practices. So you are looking at a smaller crop this year, but you're also looking at smaller exports. So the, the, the end result is your carryout number doesn't change much. And as the season wears on, the market sees not only this old crop corn coming to, to the marketplace, but they'll start harvest here in a week in Texas. So that's gradually going to weigh on the market. And that's, that's why that pressure has been pushing corn prices ever so slowly, but downward. Yeah, and we're here in Tennessee where we've seen crop condition ratings be some of the best in the, in the country, and the crops do look, look really good. Chris, at the same time this week, we saw some more impressive action on the stock market front. I mean, how much more legs does the stock market have? We continue to say, oh, we won't hit 20,000, we won't hit 21,000, we won't hit 22. Lo and behold, we do. Can this run continue? Well, you know, Ty, I mean, everybody wants to be able to call the top, and, everybody, and somebody's going get to right, you know, get it right at some point. But you know, we're about halfway, almost two-thirds through earnings season for the second quarter. And top line growth is growing 5%, 6%. Uh, earnings are growing 11 to 12% right now. And so things are actually doing well. I mean, unemployment's getting lower. Uh, companies are starting to hire again. You know, in the old days, you know, when you had better earnings, it was because of cost cutting. We still see a little bit of that, but not as much. Now it's, you know, people are actually adding to the workforce, and they're still able to improve their margins and, and their earnings. So, you know, I think for the time being, I don't see anything that's going to, you know, really derail it, you know, barring some kind of big crisis. Yeah, and Don, at the same time, talk about the U.S. dollar. I mean, when we look at our beef and we look at our exports, U.S. dollar says it all. What action are we seeing on the dollar at this point? You know, we, we saw that phenomenal rally in the dollar initially after the election. We kept talking about the, the Trump bump. Uh, that's all rolled over. Uh, we've taken out all of the gains that occurred post the election. We're now looking at the Trump slump and, and the currency values. That's really a supportive influence because it makes our goods cheaper in the international market. So from a raw commodity or an agriculture front, we should really see some benefits from the lower dollar. All right, we'll get into some of this macro picture a little bit more. We need to take a break, so we'll do that, and we'll be right back on U.S. Farm Report.
U.S. Farm Report on the Road is brought to you by DeKalb Asgro Delta Pine. Visit DeKalb.com to see the difference proven performance and leading innovation can make on your farm. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. Again, we're here from Union City, Tennessee. Chris, we were talking about the U.S. dollar. Kind of what's, what's your take? Do you think we'll continue to see this dollar weaken? Because that would only be good news uh, uh, for all of us. You know, when we look at what's going on with Brexit, for example, and we've seen, you know, even against the European current, you know, the euro and the, and the pound, you know, the dollar's weakened. And that kind of surprised me, to be honest, because with the uncertainty that's going on in Brexit and the uncertainty with the policies here in the U.S., you know, you'd think that they would probably just start kind of moving in tandem, but they haven't seen that. Um, I think where we really need to watch is some of the emerging market currencies, like the Brazilian real, where, you know, you just had that another scandal going on with their, with their new president. And you look at their, uh, their economic data that just came out earlier this week, things are not looking as good as people thought. They're not improving uh, as much or even at all um, right now. And I think even though we've seen the real uh, really appreciate over the last couple of months, I think that kind of actually is going to be something that might be worth watching because if that starts to reverse itself, that could actually put some pressure on U.S. soybean exports and some of the other commodities as well. Yeah, Brian, Chris mentioned in demand, and, and, and demand has been strong. I mean, yeah. it it's, would be scary to think if we didn't have this strong demand in soybean prices, where soybean prices would be at this point. Um, but do you think the demand train can continue? Do you think we continue down this strong path? Yeah, I, uh, from a personal perspective, when you look at the U.S. dollar and then you look at our crops probably being a little bit smaller this year, price is still holding at a very good bargain for end users. We're building a really strong demand base. So that's the, that's the good story. We're building a trough of low prices that creates steady and stable demand that ultimately when things happen in the future, prices can quickly recover. We saw that this year to some degree in beans. Good demand, we get a little weather, crop ratings go down, beans rally sharply. Uh, so there's opportunities. The key for producers is to recognize though that we're still in kind of a, a, a window here where despite what will be smaller crops in the U.S. this year, the world still has ample inventories. So we got good demand, but ample inventory, rally should be viewed as opportunities to defend. Speaking of demand, uh, Don, you know, we've, we've had a, a bullish demand story when it comes to proteins, uh, but last week we saw Japan announce that they were going to increase the tariffs on frozen beef from 38.5% to 50%. Yes. Um, does that scare you at all? I mean, how big of an impact ultimately do you think that has on, on U.S. beef? Well, I think the first thing you got to say, an 11.5% increase in the tariff rate on frozen product, not fresh, but frozen product, it's not going to help. Now, the back side of that, if you look at the, the currency situation we talked about in the earlier segment, uh, the, the decline in the value of the dollar, the surge we've seen in the Australian dollar, and where both the U.S. and Australian currencies fall against the yen, uh, the, the shift in currency values has all but offset the 11.5% increase in tariff rate for the frozen, frozen product to Japan. So, do I think that uh, we will see a decline in the next several months of frozen product going to Japan because of the higher price? Yes. Australia is not yet at a production level to offset that supply, so I still think that uh, when we get through this nine month, eight, nine month period, we will have seen a larger volume of frozen product going to Japan than what we may be fearing today. But what scares me is, Don, what triggered that, that increase in the tariff was we just barely went over that threshold. I mean, so the, the trigger point is 17% in year over year increase, and the increase was 17.1. You, so, would, you would think that there could be some latitude there, right. some negotiations. I think the real pushback from Japan is their frustration with the U.S. on our backing away from the Trans Pacific Partnership. And they're saying that those negotiable terms were included in the TPP. You backed away with it. It's your deal. Live with it. Well, and Ag Secretary Purdue has said possibly that this will spill over into other commodities. That he's fearful that it could impact other commodities. And when we look at corn, Brian, Japan is now our number one customer for corn. Sure. Beat out, beat out uh, Mexico. So are you worried about that at all? Um, I'm always worried about things, but I, that's not a priority right now. If I'm a producer, I'm more worried about if my crop looks pretty good, how do I start marketing this crop or defending prices in case they go lower? What's my plan for the year ahead? 
Uh, how, what trigger points do I sell on rallies? So, I, of course, I'm concerned about that, but I think that'll come out in the wash. That'll straighten itself out. You've got a new administration. There's some feathers that have been ruffled. Um, we'll, we'll get it figured out. Chris, real quick, demand-wise, when you look at currencies across the globe and when you look at how these different countries are, are positioned, is there any country that you're the most bullish on when it would come, come to, to demand? You know, come... I'm looking at Asia, and I'm looking at a country like India, for example, where, you know, they're growing 6 7%. You know, the new president is, you know, he's, it's been slow going, but he's been, you know, introducing some good controls. A lot of people were worried about the way he uh, took out the currencies of the larger rupee bills. Anything over 100, he kind of outlawed. And that obviously caused some short-term pain. But I think going forward, it, is, it makes a lot of sense. He's getting rid of this black market, and people are actually getting paid for what they do. And they're continuing to grow. And I think, you know, over the next 20, 30 years, they're – population is going to ex, you know, exceed China. And, you know, you have a lot of people over there that are now demanding, you know, more and more uh, high protein diets and everything else. And so, no, I think that's probably one I would look at um, other, you know, in other countries as well. All right. Thanks, Chris. Well, we need to take a short break. We'll get our closing thoughts. We'll do that when we come back on U.S. Farm Report. All right. Time now for our closing thoughts. Brian, we'll start with you. Okay. We'll keep her quick. Uh, we've got bean... A uh, crop that appears to show improvement, defend beans, buy puts in the bean market or forward sell. I know they're on a downslide, but there's more downside risk if weather stays well. With corn, look to sell rallies. We wouldn't sell into this dip. All right, not selling to this dip. Thanks, Brian. Chris? I'll switch gears and just go to the macro trends that we're seeing. You know, we're seeing a lot more activity in the investment community. People, you know, companies are growing. Unemployment's getting lower and lower. And I think uh, right now there's nothing to suggest that uh, – this is this up, uptake that we've seen is going to uh, not continue with interest rates being this low and just being very you know palatable for people to expand operations. All right, Don. As we see livestock production levels uh, of all species increasing at record levels, uh, we're we're more and more dependent on export trade. Uh, the volatility that we have seen in the market in the last handful of years, I think we really need to be thinking that is the new norm. And instead of reflecting that, okay, prices will work back into a, a slower pace, the volatility, volatility is here. Yeah, it's the name of the game. All right, thanks so much. Stay with us. We'll take a short break, and then John Phipps joins us next. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by John Deere. Where can you find the most comprehensive inventory of John Deere certified pre-owned tractors, combines, and sprayers? MachineFinder.com. Sometimes the best new addition to your fleet isn't new. Welcome back. Well, drones, is it a tool or a toy? Here's John Phipps. Over the last few years, you couldn't flip a page in a farm magazine or surf to an ag website without running into an excited article about drones. Here in August, this fascination with those flying wonders is peaking because let's face it, if I could find some way to avoid wading through this corn to scout for disease or pests or check the stand, I'd sure take it. But as much as I love technology, which is a lot, I think we may be going a little bit overboard here. Consider this headline from the Des Moines Register. Now, I'm not picking on the author of the paper, but come on, seriously? Before we embrace this view of the future, I think we should compare and contrast these two tools. Okay, first, can it take cool videos? Second, can it pull implements? Third, does it have cup holders? Fourth, can you find it in a 400-acre cornfield after it breaks down? Fifth, will it work in a 35-mile-an-hour wind? And finally, will it go through a combine? Well, it was close. But you can see the tractor wins four to two in this scientific analysis. Moreover, my experience is drones are very good at finding problems, but almost no help in solving them. It only leads to agonizing decisions about whether the threat is worth wading into the field or pouring good money after bad. I will admit, scouting with a drone is much better for your life expectancy than flying over your fields with an amateur pilot buddy in some antique puddle jumper, but you probably need to pray more often anyway. I know what some of you are thinking, that I'm just dissing drones because I'm not cool enough to own one. Well, nothing 
could be further from the truth. Still to come, change is hard, especially when it's out of your control. Coming up in our Farm Journal report, we visit a Wisconsin dairy forced to sell after a Wisconsin processor stopped taking 60 producers' milk. It's heartache and hope for the future after the break. From the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast, this is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. We have much more ahead. Four months after notified Grassland Dairy would no longer take their milk, this Wisconsin family is coping with heartache and change. The Grassland aftermath in our Farm Journal Report. American countryside is hitting the slopes in August. And drones versus tractors, which is a better tool? That's customer support. Now for the headlines, the same day soybean prices dropped 30 cents. Purdue and CME coming out with the latest ag barometer showing producer sentiments reaching near record highs. The Purdue ag barometer hit its highest level in seven months, registering at 139. The barometer economists say sentiments of the 400 producers who surveyed is markedly more positive than during summer of 2016 when barometer values were much lower. You had to go back to January of this year to, when sentiment was higher up around 150 points. It's also worth noting that a year ago at this point, last summer, sentiment was really trading between the mid 90s and low 100 points. So sentiment has improved uh, throughout the summer and it's much improved compared to last year. Now questions about expectations of commodity prices show the farmers are more optimistic about grain and oilseed prices than earlier this year. Well, we're less than two weeks away from the official launch of NAFTA renegotiations and Mexican officials laying out their priorities for the trade talks. Officials say they want an expedited renegotiation that maintains the benefits Mexico saw since striking the deal more than 20 years ago. The government also making clear they want to strengthen the energy sector. But one point that will rub the current administration administration in the U.S. wrong is about the dispute resolution mechanism. That's what hindered the U.S. from pursuing anti-dumping and anti-subsidy cases. Mexico only wants to see that resolution strengthened. While in Mexico laying groundwork for the upcoming NAFTA negotiations, Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue also took aim at the current farm labor visa program in this country. During a joint news conference, Perdue says this country's visa program for farm workers is quoting now essentially unworkable. The Ag Secretary doesn't expect farm labor immigration to come up during the NAFTA talks later this month. President Trump throwing support behind legislation that would place new limits on legal immigration and seek a system based on merit and job skills. The White House said that only one in 15 immigrants comes to the U.S. because of their skills and the current system fails to place a priority on highly skilled immigrants. This competitive application process will favor applicants who can speak English, financially support themselves and their families, and demonstrate skills that will contribute to our economy. The RAISE Act prevents new migrants and new immigrants from collecting welfare and protects U.S. workers from being displaced. The American Farm Bureau says it's studying the legislation in regard to how it may impact the clear agricultural labor needs of our farmers and ranchers. With harvest several weeks away, an Indiana farm family needs to find a backup plan for its grain storage following a spectacular incident on their farm. There goes. A grain hopper started to crumble, eventually toppling over in dramatic fashion. This video has thousands of views on Facebook. The video speaks a thousand words of the curl, I guess, but the blast, whenever it fell, it, it had a heck of a blast. I mean, the blast went 200 feet away, up and 200 feet around. It was massive. Unbelievable. White says harvest starts in three to four weeks. He says they've lost not only the hopper, but hundreds of feet of auger and the green dump. The video, as you might imagine, has yeah. gone viral. All right, that's it for the news. Meteorologist Cindy Clausen rejoins us once again. Cindy, it looks like dry conditions are spreading out in the Pacific Northwest region. Yeah, time we have seen a little dryness expanding out there and the warm temperatures that we've been seeing out there have not been helping with that. And we continue to see a ridge in the jet stream as we finish off the weekend in the northwestern United States while a trough will exit the eastern part. We've had some pretty cool air uh, in play, but we're going to see things kind of evening out as we head through the week ahead of us and 
temperatures will be above normal, especially for the southern part of the United States, and we still have that ridge in the western half of the United States as well. Heading on into Saturday, kind of status quo then on those temperatures as everything just kind of evens out. As far as the 30 day temperatures are concerned, we're looking at maybe some cooler than normal temperatures from the southern Great Lakes all the way down towards Texas, the western Gulf Coast states, looking a little on the warm side in the far northeast, Florida, and in parts of the northern plains and out into the west as far as precipitation above normal precipitation from the southeast into the southwest, but a little on the dry side in some of those very dry areas already time. Thanks, Cindy. Well, back in April, Grassland Dairy Products, a processor in Wisconsin, gave notice to dozens of dairies their contracts would be terminated at the end of the month. The decision due to a change in Canadian import rules for a product called ultra filtered milk. 58 dairies in the state were dropped, all but two found new processors. Betsy Jibben spoke with one of those families about the life since the drop. Report.com. A dark, right, quiet next, parlor Andrew sits McRae empty. takes us about as far north in Michigan as you can go. Much. And it may seem like a slippery North. slope, but others Quite unusual see it as a for sport. a dairy. American countryside Milkers, is on pipeline, the road. and farm help all out of sight. But that's the case for Quality Acres in Jefferson, Wisconsin. All the hard work. <sighs> How are things getting this, here this week? Built up like quiet. this and you know, you get a letter and it can change your life in a, in a second. <laughs> Back in April, Grassland no, Dairy Products notified its producers so it would not accept no any more milk by the end of Mike, the month. On the road every Majority week of dairies the first found a week new of home, September. while the koalas decided yeah. to sell. It's hard. I miss the cows. Couldn't do much with them anymore, but I miss them. Short notice and limited answers. We got the letter and you're on your own. Brought a string of sleepless nights. I see a milk truck I, and the dairy magazines come. It's like. <sighs> Hours on the phone to find a new processor fast. Everybody said they were full. 150 milk cows and 80 young stock. We tried, tried for weeks. Forced to sell out, now getting by raising a neighbor's cattle. I like cattle, but I didn't like having your own. Come here. The koalas are keeping their own calves and younger stock, but they'll be out of business altogether in a matter of years. Koala says the day before the family sold their final loaf, they received a last minute offer, one they could not take. If we didn't sell the cows, we'd have been dumping the milk because they were going to give us base rate plus what they say we had to pay for all the hauling and so I mean we wouldn't have probably even get been getting 14 bucks a hundred and then they told us right out that if somebody picks your milk up start looking for somebody else to take it because it's probably only going to be three or six months we haven't gotten to the end of any of those short-term contracts yet and as far as I know um, producers have not been signaled to say we will renew or continue that uh, relationship However, um, I think that what really is going to be the determining factor is what the markets feel like as we get toward that time that, the, that those short-term contracts are finished. A representative with the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection says each processor worked out its own deals. Some of those are short-term contracts, but that doesn't necessarily mean a termination. Grassland Dairy Products had said all along they had to drop producers earlier this spring due to Canada's policy and ultra-filtered milk, something that could happen again to another company. I think this could happen to other processors, yes. Wester says the company is still looking for a new market for the product, but Canada has not changed its policy. I think in July, Canada announced they were going to increase the um, quota in five of the biggest provinces. But at the same time, it has you know, made them even more longer on you know, skim milk. And that is exactly the product we were exporting. Um, so you know, by increasing the milk supply, there's even less of an incentive to work with us on increasing our market access. Everyone had a name. She always said, how do you like to be called a number? <laughs> Turning a topic as intangible as trade into real life for these lifelong producers. Not to be a farmer? No, I... I still be a farmer. As the koalas close the door on the future of their dairy, they hope others don't have to do the same. The rest of the farmers that were shut off, I hope they make it. 
Reporting in Jefferson, Wisconsin, I'm Betsy Gibbon. Thanks, Betsy. Wisconsin-based dairy business Milk Marketing Cooperative says most, if not all, of the co-op's members dropped by Grassland Dairy have found long-term agreements with other processors, contracts beyond that six-month time frame. The koalas say their son will eventually take over the farm. They hope their grandson will carry on what's left of the family's legacy. Up next, John Phipps. Crop reports, love them or hate them. is very important to us. Please hold. Well, as we gear up for USDA's next crop production report, a viewer has a question about wheat numbers. Here's John. Sue Starr sends a note regarding wheat crop reports. How can you accurately predict the 2017 wheat harvest without considering the small number of acres of wheat planted, thousands of wheat acres already baled for livestock feed, Abandon acres due to drought and extremely small yield due to drought. You are not reporting the whole picture. Sue, thank you for your feedback. Uh, send me an address. All of us here, and I'm sure our market experts have heard this criticism not only this year, but every year and for every crop. Some analysts even think USDA attempts to estimate the crop are a mistake entirely. But what took me a long time to realize is, is that these crop size numbers are not intended to be the definitive word on how much grain is out there. They are numbers that we get when we do the same yield estimating steps every year. In-season crop estimates should be weighed against previous estimates, not against absolute accuracy. By looking at the long history of these estimates, farmers and traders and users can place their own value on their worth. The key is consistency more than accuracy. However, as for accuracy, you can find graphs like this to help you decide how well estimators do. This is for the May WASDE wheat yield estimate. Values above the line mean the final yield was higher than the May estimate, and the average turned out to be 2% higher. While we all can and do argue about how these estimates are calculated, it really doesn't matter how they do it. They could be magic for all I know. What matters is if they are accurate at all. My thinking is if they do it the same way each time, history can tell us something about that accuracy. Thanks, John. And remember, if you have a question or a comment, you can email John at mailbag at usfarmreport.com. All right, coming up next, Andrew McRae takes us about as far north in Michigan as you can go. And it may seem like a slippery slope, but others see it as a sport. American Countryside is on the road next. Well, normally when you talk about snow skiing, it's in the dead of winter when several feet of powder line the mountains. But in Upper Michigan, mastering the slopes is on their mind year round, and it's a treat for all ages. There's a good chance that most of what you know about ski jumping comes from ABC's Wide World of Sports. And the agony of defeat. Oh, that was way better. But Gary Rasmussen says it's not that scary. She's jumping. Especially for the young kids, he helps learn the sport throughout the year in Ishpeming, Michigan. This is the home of the National Ski Hall of Fame, a hall that includes Gary's dad, Wilbert. He actually set the record on Suicide Hill in 1946 on his very first ever competitive jump at age 15. Gary's dad had his eyes set on the U.S. Olympic ski jumping team. He was serving in Korea in 1951 when the tryouts were held. He got leave and made the team. Yeah! Awesome! Today, Gary coaches kids learning the sport. This is a very important place in the ski jumping world. The Ishpeming Ski Club was begun in 1887, and in 1925, they built what is called Suicide Hill. A skier came off, Hans Anderson. Hans fell and had a pretty bad accident on his first jump on the hill. And a journalist in the crowd at the time said, oh my God, anybody who jumps that is committing suicide. And the name stuck. The club has had a continuous annual ski jumping competition here for over 130 years. You'd think Gary would get a break from coaching in the summer. Actually, it's one of his busiest times of the year as they simply wet down the track and land on plastic. And so it's critically important for serious 
ski jumpers to be out in the summer because we can jump every single time we schedule training. Maybe you believe ski jumping is only a sport for people not mature enough to know better. Gary says that isn't necessarily the case. I believe four, five, six years old is optimal. Although if a decent athlete who's 10, 12, or 14, um, perhaps is already a downhill skier and a little bit of a daredevil, we have seen those kids come out and excel. Gary loves helping kids learn to fly on this historic hill. First thing you gotta do is get your skis as wide as that track. And these kids love the feeling rushing down the track and into the air. It allows me to be able to fly. Why do you like flying? Because I really like birds. And this notion that the sport is dangerous, well, that may be more fiction than fact. Oh, it is far less dangerous than alpine skiing. Um, they've kept statistics at Park City and Lake Placid at the Olympic complexes and the uh, number of lost days of participation injury for ski jumping is a fraction of downhill skiing and actually more in line with the number of lost days in cross-country skiing. You may think of ski jumping as a winter sport, but it's truly year-round. And for 132 years, it's the Ishpeming Ski Club that's trained some of the top winter athletes in the nation. Traveling the countryside in Ishpeming, Michigan, I'm Andrew McCray. This is motivating me to get the girls started early. Cool story. Thanks, Andrew. You can hear more of Andrew's travels on AmericanCountryside.com. Stay with us. Tractor Tales is next. Visit FarmJournalPro.com. Trusted analysis, professional insight. FarmJournalPro.com. Tractor Tales is brought to you by John Deere. Where can you find the most comprehensive inventory of John Deere certified pre-owned tractors, combines, and sprayers? Machinefinder.com. Sometimes the best new addition to your fleet isn't new. Welcome back to Tractor Tales, folks. This week, we're gonna go to Western Ohio to check out a very unique piece of equipment. Bruce Baker had this 1951 Unito restored and painted. It runs on a Farmall Cub engine and was thought to have been used in airports towing luggage carts. It's a tractor like they use at airports, and uh, it's pretty rare. As far as I know, there's only about three of them left in the United States. It's a 1951, and it's made by a company by the name of Hansel Green, but it's got a Farmall Cub engine transmission and rear end, but it's been shortened up, so it's got a real short wheelbase. So it's pretty rare and unusual. I, I would assume it was used like an airport to pull the luggage uh, uh, trucks around. I've had it for about 35 years. I bought it at a salvage yard, had to replace the motor in it. It would have approximately 10 horsepower, the same as a standard farm oil cub. It's been made like from uh, 47 up to the 50s. The later ones had a bigger, a little more horsepower, but the actually same cubic inch, but just more uh, compression ratios and a bigger carburetor. We're not sure what the original color was. We figured it would probably been either yellow or possibly an orange. My brother lived just down the road, used it for several years to pull these uh, wagons around uh, at the for his auger and into the grain leg and. He, he pulled his own. It was very, it had a big heavy weight behind the axle and one in the front. So it would pull a lot more than an average cub because of its weight. When we restored this tractor, we painted the basic tractor itself yellow, but everything that was made by International Harvester, we painted red. So this would be the identical engine as an earlier farm oil cub. And the transmission is the same as the early farm old cub. The only difference is it's got a real short clutch housing. Would you like me to start it? Sure. Thanks so much. Well, today's country church salute goes to the Jeffers Baptist Church located in Jeffers, Minnesota. They celebrated their 100th anniversary last weekend. The church was rebuilt after a 1998 tornado ripped through the area, but the congregation is still strong. Our thanks to Charles Grant for sharing their story. All right, stay with us. We have From the Farm Photos next. Welcome back. Well, it's harvest time in California. Don Cameron says processed tomato harvest is in full swing near Helm, California. At Terra Nova Ranch, he says they feed 200,000 people for a full year. 
with the tomatoes that they grow there. And congratulations to our July photo cover winner on Facebook, Chris Holmes. He helped photograph his friend Tony Gallo harvesting wheat in Bisbee, North Dakota. Thanks for that. If you have a picture that you would like to send in, you can do that to the address on the screen. For all of us at U.S. Farm Report, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to tune in next week as we work to build on our tradition. Have a great weekend, everyone. U.S. Farm Report, America's longest lasting news program for farmers, is powered by Ram Trucks, America's longest lasting pickups. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast.